from our studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. This is a CUBE Conversation. Hello everyone, welcome to this special CUBE Power Panel recorded here in Palo Alto, California. We got remote guests uh, from around the internet. We have Evan Anderson, Mark Anderson, Phil Lowhouse, thanks for coming on. Uh, Evan is uh, with Invent IP, an organization um, from, that's with companies and individuals that fight nation-sponsored intellectual property theft and also author of the huge uh, report, Theft Nation. Um, almost 100 pages of really comprehensive analysis on it. Mark Anderson with the Future in Review, CEO of Pattern Computer and Strategic News Service, chairman of Future in Review, Con in Review Conference, and author of the book, The Pattern Future, Finding the World's Greatest Secrets and Predicting the Future Using Discovery Patterns, and Phil Lowhouse, American Enterprise Institute, former in intelligent analyst researcher at the American, Inst uh, American Enterprise Institute, kind of studying competitive strategy and emerging technologies. Guys, thanks for coming on. This topic is, is industrial IoT the new battleground? Uh, Mark, you cover the future <laughs> review. This is, security is the battleground. It's not just a siloed space, it's horizontally scalable across every single touch point of the internet, individuals, national security, companies, global. What's your perspective on this new battleground? Well, thank you. I, I took the, some time and watched your last presentation on this, which I thought was excellent. And maybe I'll try to pick up from there. Um, there's a lot of discussion there about the technical aspects of IoT or IIoT and some of the weaknesses, you know, firewalls failing and assume that someone's in your network. Um, but I think that there's a deeper aspect to this. And the, the problem I think, John, is that um, yes, they are in your, in, your, in your network already, but the deeper problem here is who is it? Is it an individual? Is it a state? And whoever it is, uh, I, I'm going to put something out that I think is going to be worth talking more deeply about. And that is the people who can do the most damage are already in there and are ready to do it. And the question isn't, can they? It's why have they not? And so um, literally, I think if you ask world leaders today, are they in the electric grid? Yes. Is Russia in ours? Are we in theirs? Yes. If you said, uh, is China in our, in our most important you know, areas of enterprise? Absolutely. Is Iran in our banks and so forth, they are. And you actually see states of war going on that are nuisances, but are not what you might call cybergeddon. And I really believe that the world leaders are truly afraid, perhaps more afraid of that than of nuclear war. So the amount of death and destruction that could happen if everybody cut loose at the same time is so horrifying. My guess is that there is a, a human restraint involved in this, but that technically it's already game over. Phil, Cybergeddon, I love that term because that's you know part of our theme here is apocalypse now or later. Industrial IoT or IoT or the internet, all these touch points are creating um, a surface area that for penetrations purposes, any packet can get in. Nation states, malware, you name it, it's all a problem. But this is the new war battleground. This is now digital Cybergeddon. Forget the wall on the southern border, physical wall. We're talking about a digital wall. This is, we are major threats going on to our society in the United States and global. There's a new, Enga rules of engagement or no rules of engagement on how to compete in a digital war. This is something that the government's supposed to protect us for. I mean, if someone drops troops in, you know, in California, physical people, the government's supposed to stop that. But if it's a digital war, it's packets. You know, and the companies are responsible for all this. This doesn't make any sense to me. Break it down, what's the problem and how do we solve this? Sure. Well, the problem is, is that we're actually facing di different kinds of threats than we're, we've been typically used to facing in the past. So in the past, when we go to war, we may have a problem with a, a foreign country or um, a conflict is coming up. Um, we tend to, and by we, I mean in the United States, um, we tend to think of these things as we're going to send troops in or we're going to actually have a physical fight um, or we're going to have some kind of other decisive culmination of events or, and of a conflict. Um, what we're dealing with now is very different, um, and it's actually something that isn't entirely new, um, but the adversaries that we're facing now, so let's say China, Russia, and Iran, just to kind of throw them into some buckets, they think about war very differently. They think about the information space more broadly, and partially because they've been so used to having to kind of be catching up to America in terms of technology, they found other ways to compete with America in ways that we really haven't been focusing on. Um, and that really, I would argue, extends uh, most prominently into the information space. And by the information space, I'm speaking very broadly. I'm talking about 
not just um, information in terms of like social media and um, emails and things like that, but also things like what we're talking about today, like IIoT. Um, and these are new uh, threat landscapes and ones where our competitors um, have a integrated way of approaching the conflict, one in which the state and private sector kind of are molded or fused or at least are compelled to work together. And we have a very different space here in the United States and I'm um, you know, happy to unpack that as we talk about that today. But um, what we're now facing is not just about uh, technical capabilities, it's about differences in governing systems and differences in governing paradigms. And so it's much bigger than just talking about uh, the technical specifics. Evan, I want you to weigh in on this because one of the things that um, I feel strongly about, and this is pretty obvious from the commentary and experts I talk to is, uh, the United States has always been good at defending itself physically, you know, war and being places, but digitally we've been really good at offense, but terrible on defense and has been the metaphor. I spoke with um, former four-star general Keith Alexander, who ran the NSA and was the first uh, commander of the Cyber Command, who now is the CEO of IronNet. He and I were talking uh, on camera and, and privately, and he's saying, look at, you know, we suck at defense digitally. We're great at offense. We can take someone out on the offense, but we're talking about IOT, about monitoring. And these are technical challenges. And this is network nerds and software engineers have to solve this problem with the, with the, through the, the prism of defense. This is a new paradigm. This is what we're kind of getting to. And Mark, you, you kind of addressed it, but this is the challenge. This, IOT is going to create more points that we have to defend that's, we suck now at defending. Why are we going to get better? This is a, this is the paradox. Yeah, uh, I think that's that's certainly accurate. And one of our problems here is that as a society, we've always been open, and that was how the internet was born. And so we have a real paradigm shift now from a world in which the U.S. was leading an open world that was using the internet for. I mean, there there have been problems with security since day one, but um, originally the internet was an information sharing exercise. And we've reached a point in human history now where there are enough malicious actors that have the capabilities we didn't want them to have uh, that we need to change that outlook. So looking at things like industrial IoT, what you're seeing is not so much that this is the battlefield in specific, it's that everything like it is now the battlefield. So in my work specifically, we're focused more on economic problems, economic conflicts and strategies. And if you look at the doctrines that have come out of our adversaries in the last decade, um, or really 20 years, uh, they they very much did what Phil said, and they they looked at our weaknesses. And one of those biggest weaknesses that we've always had is that an open society is also unable necessarily to completely defend itself from those who would seek to exploit that openness. And so we have to figure out as a society, and I believe we are, um, but we're we're running a fine line, and we're negotiating this this tightrope right now that involves defending the the values and the foundational um, critical aspects of our society that require openness, uh, while also making sure that all the doors aren't open for adversaries. And so we'll, we'll continue to deal with that as a society. Yeah. Um, everything is now a battlefield in a much grayer area and IOT certainly isn't helping. And that's why we have to work so hard on it. I want to talk about the economic piece on the next talk track around theft and uh, intellectual property that you cover deeply. But Mark and Phil, this notion of cybergeddon meets the fact that we have to be more defensive. Again, principles of openness are out there. I mean, we have open source. There is a there is a potential path here. Open source software has been, I think, you know, depending on you talk fourth generation or fifth, depending on how old you are. But it's now mainstream enough. Now, are we ever going to get to a formula where we can actually be defense strong at defense as well as just offense with respect to protecting uh, digitally? Bill, you want that? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I would just say that um, I'm glad to hear that uh, General Alexander is confident about our offensive capabilities. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the large about here too, the NSA that is, is conducting these offensive capabilities. Um, when we talk about Russia, Iran, China, or even a smaller group, like let's call, let's say like a, an extremist group or something like that, um, there's an integration between command and command and control that we simply don't have here in the States. So for example, I, the uh, Panasonic, uh, it, it, the Panasonic and Sony examples are, are always come to mind as ones where there are attacks that can happen against American companies um, that then have larger implications that go beyond just those companies. Um, so, and this may not be a case where the NSA is even tracking the threat. 
Um, there's been some legislation that's come out, um, you know, rather, rather controversial legislation about so-called hacking back initiatives and things like that. Um, but I think everybody knows that this is already kind of happening. Um, the real question is going to be, how does the public sector and how does the private sector work together to create this environment where they're working in, um, in synergy rather than at cross purposes? Yeah, and this brings up, I've heard this before, um, with you, we've oh talked God. about the, the fact that open source, nation states can actually empower by releasing tools in open source via the dark web or other vehicles to actually not have their quote fingerprints on any attacks. This seems to be a tactic. Um, right. or, or go through criminals, right? Uh, use proxies, things like that. I mean, it's getting even more complicated. And, and Alexander's talked about that as well, right? He's talked about the convergence of crime and nation state action. So, whereas with nation states, it's already hard to attribute enough. If that's being outsourced to either, whether it's patriotic hackers or criminal groups, it's even more difficult. I think you know, Keith is a good friend of Oliver, is obviously a um, good guy. Um, his point is a good one. And I'd like to take it a little more, a little more extreme state and say, uh, de defense is worth doing and probably hopeless. <laughs> so, um, uh, as they always say, all it takes is one failure. So, um, we always talk about defense, but really, he's right. We, offense is easy. You want to go after somebody, we can get them. But if you want to play defense against a trillion points of failure, potential points of failure, there's no chance. And I, one way to say this is, if we ignore individuals for a moment and just look at nation states, it's pretty clear that any nation state of size that wants to get into a certain network will get in. And then the question would be, well, once they're in, can they actually do damage? And the answer is probably, yeah, they probably can. Well, why don't they? Why don't they do more damage? Well, kind of back to the original premise here that there's some restraint going on. Um, and I, I suspect that Keith's absolutely right because in general, they don't want to get attacked. They don't want to have come back at them what they're about to do to your banks or your grid. And we could do that. We all could do that. So my guess is that there's a little bit of a, a failure on our part to have deep discussions about how great our defenses either are or are not, when frankly the idea of defense is a good idea, worthwhile idea, but not, not really achievable. Yeah, it's a great point. That comes up a lot where it's like people don't want retaliation, so it's a big critical event that happens that's noticeable as a counter strike or equivalent. But there's been discussion of the, I call it the slow bleed where they push the line of where that is and like slowly infiltrate and just cause disruption and inconvenience mm -hmm. as a tactic. This has become something we're seeing a lot of, whether it's misinformation campaigns uh, on fake news to just disrupting operations slowly over time and just kind of, you know, thousand paper cuts, uh, if you will. Your th guys' thoughts on that, is that something that you guys see uh, out there that's, that's happening? Well, you, you saw Iran go after our banks and we were pushing Iran pretty hard on the, on the sanctions. Everybody knows they did that. Uh, it wasn't very much fun for anybody, but they didn't. what they didn't do is take down the entire banking system. Not sure they could, but they didn't. So, yeah, yeah, I would just add there that you see this on multiple fronts. You see, this is by design. I mean, if you, I, I'm sure that Mark is talking about this in his report, but they talk about this incremental approach that um, you know, over time, can it, uh, this is part of the problem, right? Is that we have a very kind of uh, black or white conception of warfare in this country. Um, and a lot of times even companies are going to think, well, you know, we're at peace. So why would I do something that may actually be construed as something that's um, warlike or offensive or things like that. But in reality, this is, um, even though we aren't technically at war, um, all these other actors view this as a real conflict. And uh, so we have to get creative about like how we think about this within the uh, paradigm that we have and the legal strictures that we have here in this country. Well, there's no doubt in my, at least my non-expert military opinion, but as someone who is a techie, been on the internet from day one all my life and all those tools, you guys as well, I personally think we're at war 100%, there's no debate on that. And I think that we have to get better policy around this and understand it better um, because it's happening. And one of the obvious areas that we see in the news every day is Huawei and intellectual property theft. This is an economic impact. I mean, let's just look at what's happening in Brexit in the UK. And if that was essentially manipulated, that's the ultimate smart bomb is to just destroy their financial system, which ended up happening through that misinformation. So there are economic realizations here, Evan, that not only come from the misinformation campaigns and other hacks, but there's real value with intellectual property. This is yes, the report you put out. Your, your thoughts. 
there's very much an active conflict going on in the economic sphere and that's that's certainly an excellent point i think one of the most important things that most of the world doesn't quite understand yet but our adversaries certainly understand is that wars are fought for usually just a few reasons and there's a lot of different justification that goes on but often it's for economic benefit and if you look at human history and if you look at modern history a lot of wars were fought for some form of economic benefit um, often in the form of territory, et cetera. But in the modern age, information can directly and very quite obviously translate into economic benefit. And so when you're bleeding information, you're really bleeding money. And when I say information, again, it's a broad word, but intellectual property, which our definition here at Invent IP is quite broad too, uh, is incredibly valuable. And so if you have an adversary that's consistently uh, removing intellectual property from what I would call our, our information ecosystem and our business ecosystem. We're losing a lot of economic value there, and that's what wars are fought over. And so to pretend that this conflict isn't active and to pretend that the underlying economy and economic strength that is bolstered or created by intellectual property uh, isn't critical uh, would be silly. And so I think we need to look at those kinds of dynamics and the kind of the Grasimov doctrine and the essential doctrine of unrestricted warfare that came out of the People's Republic of China are focused on avoiding kinetic conflict while succeeding at the kinds of conflicts that are more preferable, particularly in an asymmetric environment. And so that's what we're dealing with. Mark and Phil, people waking up to this is um, this the reality. I mean, I'm certainly people in the know are that I talk to, but generally speaking across the board, is this a woke moment for tech? Uh, this Armageddon now or later? Moment for, for, uh to a moment for politicians, not for tech, I think. So they're the, the old, I'm sure Phil would agree with this, but the old guard, um, um, it go back to, to when Keith was running the NSA, but at that time, um, there was a very clear distinction between military and economic security. And so when you said security, that meant military. And now all the rules have changed, all of the, uh, the ways that CFIUS works in the United States have changed, uh, the legislation is changing. And now if, if you want to talk about security, most major nations equate economic security with national security. And that wasn't true 10 years ago. That's a great point. That's really profound. I totally agree. On the, on the, on the, on the, I would just... Phil. Oh, I think you're seeing a change in um, realization in, in Washington about this. I mean, if you look at the cybersecurity strategy of 2018, it specifically says that we're going to be moving from a posture of active defense to one of defending forward. And we can get into the discussion about what those words mean, but the way that I usually boil it down is it means going from defending, but maybe a little bit forward to actually going out and making sure that our interests are protected. And the reason why that's important, and we were talking about offense versus defense here, um, obviously the reason why, uh, from what Mark was saying, if, you if they're already in the networks and they haven't actually done anything, it's because they're afraid of what that offensive response could be. So it's important that we selectively demonstrate what costs we could impose on different actors for different kinds of actions, especially knowing that they're already inside of our networks. That's a great point. I mean, that's I think that's, again, another profound statement because it's almost like the pin and the grenade. Once they pull it, it's damage is done. Again, back to our theme, Armageddon now or later. How, what's the answer to this, guys? I mean, is it is it to push the policy conversation and the potential consequences higher, get that narrative going? Is it more technical protection in the networks? What's some of the uh, things that are people talking about, thinking about around this? And it's really all of the above. So um, the tough part about this for any society and for our society is that it's expensive to live in a world with this much insecurity. And so when these kinds of low level conflicts are going on, it costs money and it costs resources. And companies had to deal with that. They, they spent a long time trying to dodge security costs. And now particularly with the advent of um, new law like the GDPR in Europe, it's becoming untenable not to, not to spend that defensive money even as a company, right? But uh, we also are looking at a deep need to change policy. And I think there's been a lot of progress made, uh, Mark mentioned the CFIUS reforms. Um, there are a lot of different, essentially games of whack-a-mole being played all around the world right now, figuring out how to chase these security problems that we let go too long. Um, but there's many, many, many fronts that we yeah, need. Whack-a-mole is a great example. And yeah, a visualization of that is just, it's, it's horrendous. It's uh, you know, not the ideal scenario. But I got to get your point on this because one of the things that that's comes up all the time in our conversations on theCUBE is 
the government's job is to protect our security. So again, if if someone came in and you know invaded my town in Palo Alto, you know it's not my responsibility to fight for the town. Maybe defend my own house, but uh, you know if I'm a company and I'm being attacked by Russia or China or Iran. Isn't it the government's responsibility to protect me as a citizen and the company doing business there? So again, this is the kind of the, the, the confusion that people have. <clears throat> and Sony's got to defend their hack and certainly got to put security practices in place. This is new ground for the government, digitally speaking. When we started this Invent IP uh, project out, it was about seven years ago. And uh, I was told by a very smart guy in DC that our greatest challenge was going to be American corporations, global corporations, and he was absolutely right literally in this fight to protect intellectual property and to protect the welfare even of corporations our greatest enemies so far have been american corporations and they lobby hard for china while china is busy stealing from them and stealing from their company and stealing from their country all that stuff's going on on a daily basis and they're in dc lobbying in favor of china don't do anything to make them mad and, well, they're getting and their pockets really picked at the same going. time they're trying to do business in china they're getting their yeah. pockets picked that's what exactly. you're saying. They, they're going for the quarterly earnings report and that's all. So the, the, yeah, so, the mean, problem is the note, companies would... themselves are kind of self-inflicted wounds here for them. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, just to add to that, I mean, on this note, there have been some um, businesses to add that interest. And this is something that you're seeing a little bit more of. Um, there, there's been legislation through CFIUS and things like that. Uh, there have been reforms that have discouraged the flow of Chinese money into Silicon Valley. And there's actually been a measurable difference in that because people just don't want to deal with the paperwork. They don't want to deal with the reputational risk, et cetera, et cetera. And this is going to really be the key challenge is um, having policymakers not only that are interested in um, addressing this issue, because not all of them are even convinced it's a problem, if you can believe it or not, but having them interested and then having them spun up and having them um, understand the issue in a way that the legislation can actually be helpful and not get in the way of things that we value, such as um, such as innovation and entrepreneurialism and things like that. So um, it's going to take sophisticated policymaking and um, incentive create aligning incentives so that companies actually want to participate in helping to make America safer. You know, you're so right about the politicians. Capitol Hill is really not educated. I mean, I tell my kids, and uh, they ask the same question. I go, Just look at work, watch Mark Zuckerberg and Sundar Pakai present to the government. They don't even know what an Android phone versus an iPhone is. Never mind, you know what what the internet and how this global economy works. This has become a makeup problem of the personnel in, in Capitol Hill. You guys I, see any movement? I mean, I'm seeing some um, changeover with a new guard, a new generation of younger people coming in. If, certainly from the military, that's an easy one. You see people get this, uh, but a new generation of young millennials who are saying, hey, why are we doing this old way? And actually becoming more informed, not being the lawyer at the lawmaking, it's actually more technically savvy. Is there any movement, any bright hope there? I think there's a little hope in the sense that at a time when Congress has trouble keeping the lights on, they seem to have bipartisan agreement on this set of issues that we're talking about. So. Um, that's hopeful. You know, we've we've seen a number of strongly bipartisan uh, issues supported in Congress uh, with the Senate, with the House, all agreeing that this is an issue for us all. That they need to protect the country. They need to protect IP. They need to extend the definition of security. Um, there's no argument there, and that's a very strange thing in today's D.C. to have no argument between the parties. There's no there's no error between the GOP and the Democrats, as far as I can tell. Yeah. They seem to all agree on this, and and so it's a, it is hopeful. Freedom has its cost, and I think this is a new era of modern um, freedom and warfare and protection, and, and all these dynamics are changing, just like Cloud 2.0 is changing uh, application developers. Guys, this is a really important topic. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Appreciate it. Love to do a follow-up on, on this again with you guys. Thanks for sharing your insight. Uh, some great profound statements there. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. It's been a cube power panel here from Palo Alto, California with Evan Anderson, Mark Anderson, and Phil Lowhouse. Thank you guys for coming on. Power panel, the next battleground in industrial IoT. Security is a big part of it. Thanks for watching. This has been theCUBE.